So without further ado, uh, Larry, could you please uh, uh, kick it off and give us the context? <clears throat> Thank you, Zach. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Larry Wolk. I am a pediatrician by training, still practice very much part-time on Wednesday afternoons, except today, of course, because I'm here, uh, and was appointed uh, three years ago uh, by Governor John Hickenlooper in Colorado to be the chief marijuana, uh, chief medical officer, I'm sorry, um, for the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So. Um, Glad that got a laugh, because in some audiences, not so much. All right, so um, I'm gonna start off, I heard in the last session somebody give context, and I think context is important as we all try to sort of move to the middle and become objective thinkers when it comes to marijuana and medicine. So uh, like many of you, I grew up with parents who said, no, no drugs, don't use drugs, and marijuana was included in those conversations. I went to school and learned about all the bad drugs like marijuana. Uh, I went to medical school to become a doctor and was told how to ask questions about bad drugs like marijuana and to counsel against the use of marijuana. And now I find myself in a position uh, to regulate uh, legal medical marijuana as well as legal recreational marijuana. So I cannot have an opinion and do not have an opinion because I'm a regulator. It's up to the people of the state of Colorado uh, to determine uh, whether or not marijuana is medicine. So um, the answer to that question, um, which is, uh, I'm kind of cheating, but uh, in, in the state of Colorado, marijuana is medicine as defined by the New England Journal of, oh no, actually by the state constitution. So as a physician in the state of Colorado, I'm not guided necessarily by research or peer review or evidence basis. I'm guided by the state constitution, which says that um, marijuana is medicine. So um, my comments as it relates to that, given my experience uh, now as the uh, public health official for the state are, um, it's very difficult um, to call marijuana medicine because of the heterogeneous nature of marijuana. Uh, we're a bit of the Wild West uh, in Colorado, and uh, we have been learning as we've been going along. But marijuana is not um, just a, a single dose of THC or CBD or terpenes. Uh, it's not something that's just smoked. It can be eaten. It can be dabbed. It comes in wax and oil. Uh, there's buds, there's flowers, uh, and um, again, you, you can take it all different ways and, and, and do all kinds of things. And can, can anybody think of uh, anything in medicine um, that, that, that's like that? Um, because uh, what I always say is an analogy is uh, if you're a provider, a physician, a prescriber, uh, think about that patient that comes into your office with congestive heart failure. Uh, and instead of writing a prescription for that patient, you're gonna give them the seeds to a foxglove plant, and you're gonna say, go home and, and grow this in a certain way, and by the way, juice the leaves this way, uh, and I want you to smoke a little bit uh, just from the flower of that, but try to sort of take it down to a certain tincture. Well, well we don't do that, right? We write a prescription for digoxin, uh, which is derived from the foxglove plant um, through a number of steps and through years of research and what we know about potency and safety and side effects. And so um, it, it's hard for this guy that I gave you the context about to sort of think about um, marijuana uh, as medicine. Um, you know, speaking of, of potency, um, you'll hear from my esteemed colleagues uh, quite a bit more about that, but you know, when we regulate marijuana as medicine, uh, we're trying to regulate um, potency because we don't have the support of the federal agencies which we take for granted when it comes to having medicines. So we've had to recreate all kinds of regulatory schemes and bodies in order to establish potency so that when somebody is buying, let's say, high CBD, low THC oil for their child who's constantly seizing and wants to make sure that they're not giving their child any THC, um, then we have to try and find a way to, to provide some level of quality assurance, some level of quality assurance when it comes to um, the amount of THC, whether it's the percentage or the milligrams. On the flip side, no, nobody really thought about the potential for contamination. 
Um, these are plants. These are plants uh, uh, upon which pesticides uh, are applied. Uh, they're grown in soils that have the potential to have microbes and solvents and heavy metals. And so um, there's no FDA to make sure that um, these are safe if they're consumed or if they're smoked. And so we have to put into place, uh, you know, like any other state that's considering marijuana as medicine, the appropriate safeguards because we don't necessarily have uh, and don't have the backup the, of the federal government who considers this um, as um, illegal. Um, on the second point then, you know, when marijuana is considered as medicine, um, the medical community gets thrust right into the center of this um, as if to create a, a credible medicinal environment. So we as physicians, those of us again who have been trained so extensively in all of the medical uses of marijuana, are now in the position of being the ones who have to make a recommendation in order for a patient to get a card so that they can get medical marijuana. So we have three different types of physicians in the state of Colorado. We have a physician like me, who's begged by that patient every now and again, please, can you just sign my card? I'd like to try this for pain, or I'd like to try this for my child, or whatever. And so I might be convinced to do one or two or three of those a year. We have a 1,000 plus physicians in the state of Colorado who do five or less recommendations per year so that that handful of patients can go ahead and get their card. We have the second type of physician who are the ones who really believe. They're the believers. They've been to the courses. They've went to Woodstock in the 60s. They did all this you know, research and things like that and said, hey, I get this. I understand this. And in their heart of hearts, they take the time to know what the varietals are and what the doses are and how people should take it. And I think they legitimately believe in what they're prescribing when it comes to medical marijuana. Unfortunately, the bulk of the medical marijuana that's recommended in the state is recommended by about 30 physicians who are in it for themselves. They uh, uh, will charge you an amount uh, to come in and get an evaluation. They may or may not examine you. They're supposed to have a bona fide patient-physician relationship, but who knows if that actually happens or not. And they charge you more uh, based on the amount of marijuana you'd like to have for medicinal purposes. And in it's in their opinion whether or not it's medically necessary for you to have even more. So in our Constitution, there's a standard amount, one ounce or six plants. Um, again, very well documented in the medical research that a standard amount of marijuana is one ounce. <laughs> one ounce of what? Six plants of what? You, you can grow a pound of usable cannabis, they tell me, off of a single plant. I mean, so you, you can have all kinds of sort of iterations. And in spite of that, you'll still have physicians recommending 99 plants or three pounds as medically necessary. You know, by the way, if you want that recommendation, it's gonna cost you because I'm gonna charge you more based on you know, the more that you need. So um, that's uh, kind of what happens when you push physicians into the middle of this, as many states do, in an effort to try and get or, or, or gain some credibility. Uh, the last thing that I'll move on uh, is that we were asked about whether or not we're creating some type of socioeconomic disparity here. You know, is marijuana now um, more costly or less costly, and so is it uh, less affordable for folks because um, insurance um, won't cover it since it's considered medicine. And I would say it's less affordable in a place like Colorado now because it's taxed. Medical is taxed, but recreational is taxed even higher. And so we're now creating a disparity where patients are now having to choose um, whether or not they want to pay for marijuana, or maybe now it's forcing them back into looking at opiates, which we've tried so hard to get them away from, or even other alternatives. So I'll stop there and, and save the rest for questions and move on to Carrie. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I had this uh, awful her heretical thought as you were describing uh, the three classes of doctors. I wonder if that same parallel also applies to just doctors prescribing genetic testing. Think about it. <laughs> Carrie. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me here today. So I am a pharmacist, and uh, as well as a clinical pharmacologist. And my 
kind of role within, I guess, Colorado and, and kind of different states around, around the country has been to try and advise those clinicians that are being thrust into this environment what we know about uh, cannabis and the various derived products that, that come from cannabis, trying to inform them what do we know um, so that they are able to counsel patients um, as well as families and other providers on essentially what is perhaps effective but certainly <coughs> safe use of these products. Um, I think that if we look at taking on cannabis in this manner, manner to provide education to our providers, it's a never-ending task. And part of that reason is, is that there are years and years of misinformation as well as public anxiety around ma marijuana. People are, have been, are recognized that of its illegal status and so therefore have been told, you know, ask about the, the misuse of this product and, and therefore cannot see any uh, benefit from it. Uh, and then on the flip side, there's those who have been told up and down, no one has ever died from, from a cannabis overdose. And so therefore, it's the safest thing we have out there. Why wouldn't we give it to everybody in hopes that it would cure everything out there? So, so those are two very contrasting positions that, that most uh, patients and the public and providers can take. And I try the best as possible to look through the data and try to bring them to the, to the middle and, and, and use, use these products wisely. The question is, is, is that we've been asked to address, should we be trying to study cannabis like we do other uh, medicinal products? And I know the two gentlemen to my right will certainly be speaking to, the, to that. But I think that we need to look at the data that already exists because anybody who takes a drug should know what's in it and what are, what are we thinking the effects are. Secondly, do I know if I take this drug, is it even gonna get to where it needs to go in my body to work? Thirdly, if, can I measure the effects once I do take it? How do I know it's working for me? And then lastly, how, how quickly will the effects take and how long will they last? These things can be studied and are typically studied in clinical trials in proof of pharmacologic concept studies and pharmacokinetic studies. But we don't have a whole lot of those kinds of data for the products that our patients are currently using. One of the issues is because of the regulation, we are required to use the federally mandated marijuana, which quite frankly doesn't have, or traditionally hasn't, it's ex ever expanding, but it traditionally hasn't had the wide variety of strains, strengths, and composition that actually all those growers in Colorado are currently experimenting with. So the question then becomes, if, if a grower says to you, hey, this is my brand new product, it's got high levels of THC, low levels of CBD, and increasing concentrations of CBG, which is the coolest thing since sliced bread, and you say, well, where's the evidence of that? And unfortunately, we don't have that because of the ways in which we're not allowed to truly study what people are actually using. So then, I, I liked the discussion earlier today about the N of one trials. Should we be enrolling patients into databases as they experiment with these different strains to try to determine what are the effects that they're having? What, um, is there a particular side effect or clinical effect that they're seeing when they use different products? When are those side effects occurring? And, and what is the long-term effect on those diseases? Uh, I partnered recently um, in for, a, for a grant uh, proposal with a mobile phone uh, company to try to come up with a way in which after users would use a particular strain that they would report on, that they could go on after their dosing and talk, and not talk, but enter in kind of using a sliding scale. This is how I felt, this is how long I felt it, and so on. Just so, because these people are using the products, what kind of data can we get from them so we can better learn what's happening? 
I think that, that as we gain more knowledge about these products, it's very important to continue continually educate the providers and the public about what's really happening. And the reason I say this is that, that because there's people very loudly shouting from each side of the room, you know, this drug, uh, this product is the devil, stay away from it, versus those saying this is the panacea, we can use it for everything, we need to try and have as best as possible a realistic conversation for what these products can do because there are people who are benefiting from, from the sale um, of these products. And I'm just gonna leave you with, with one, um, one example. Um, for those of you who are older, perhaps you remember um, a certain commercial for certs, which is um, a breath mint. It's a candy mint. It's a candy mint. Two months in one. At two <laughs> months in one. And, and w what happened magically when that when that drop came down, what did it say? Certs with? Retson. Retson. Yeah. Right? Do you remember that? I don't yeah. remember the Retson. You don't remember Retson? <laughs> Some of you do. So let me ask you, what is Retson? No clue. THC. <laughs> <laughs> well, they would have you believe in the commercial as the drop came down and went ting with the minty fresh flavor that it had something to do with the, the mint, but actually it was a tablet binding formula. <laughs> so, I just want to bring up to the point that they can use, people who are manufacturing these products can say whatever they want about, the, about what's in these products and what the good of them is for, and we need to make sure we're protecting our public um, from, from those kinds of kind of predatory behaviors. Great. Thank you very much. So I just want to say I'm gratified. Not only uh, this has been very illuminating, but the tone of here is great. And I think, as as um, Larry said, we're trying to stay in the middle where we don't we're not on the shouting sides. So let's see if we can continue that, Donald. So usually when I give a PowerPoint uh, talk, my second slide, my disclosure slide, says that I went to college in the '60s. Uh, just up north, actually, in Providence. And although it usually uh, draws some uh, laughter. S something may have affected your brain because actually that's that? south. <laughs> oh, south, you're right. I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. Wait, I did inhale. It you're right. <laughs> so, so although people usually do laugh, uh, it is, I think, an important credential. So uh, ultimately, uh, during my fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, to uh, be an oncologist, uh, suddenly AIDS came out of the blue. And we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. And I became a champion of alternative therapies, even when there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got conventional therapy, which was AZT, I said, ooh, this isn't very good. So I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks on complementary and alternative therapies. And then in 1992, Rick Doblin, who is, has a PhD, from the Harvard School of Government and organized uh, something called the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, sent a letter to San Francisco General Hospital suggesting that a clinical trial uh, showing the benefit of cannabis uh, should come from Brownie Mary's institution. Mary Rathbun was a volunteer in our clinic in the AIDS uh, program at San Francisco General. And she was our volunteer of the year uh, twice. Uh, she was a 70-year-old woman who used to wheel our patients uh, to x-ray and drop their prescriptions off uh, in the pharmacy, but she also baked them brownies, hence she was known as Brownie Mary. And in 1992, I was at the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam, of all places, and I was glancing at CNN headline news, and Brownie Mary was being arrested for baking brownies for patients in the AIDS clinic. And that prompted Rick Doblin to send this letter cold to the director of research of the AIDS program, which I was not. I had, however, founded a group, a community-based clinical trials network in San Francisco in 1986 called the Community Consortium, which was physicians in the community caring for people living with HIV AIDS. And we conducted community-based clinical trials and actually established the first community advisory forum of any AIDS uh, research group that subsequently became mandated 
by the National Institute, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease that all AIDS research groups have input from community, i.e. patients. So the letter was brought to me by a colleague who said, well, I thought maybe you'd be interested in this. So that began my attempts to study cannabis. 1992 was also an interesting year because up until 92, the US government had a so-called compassionate use program. And they were providing canisters of 300 cannabis cigarettes rolled in Pall Mall cigarette paper to a handful of patients with so-called orphan diseases. And in 1992, we didn't have any treatment for AIDS that was effective. Many patients developed the so-called AIDS wasting syndrome. And there was a concern that these people would say that they had an orphan disease and they would demand from the government compassionate use program 300 cannabis cigarettes monthly. So Bush one closed the compassionate use program at that time to new enrollees. That was the year also that dronabinol, which is synthetic delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the main psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, was expanded in its indication. It was approved in 1986 for treatment of chemotherapy related to nausea and vomiting. Uh, nausea vomiting related to chemotherapy, sorry. And in 1992, the FDA expanded the indication to treat the anorexia associated with weight loss in AIDS. Placebo-controlled trials did not show an improvement in weight, but only an increase in appetite. But to be able to say, see, you don't need the compassionate use program, here's your cannabis, i.e. Delta-9 THC as dronabinol, the FDA expanded the indication. So we started recommending dronabinol to our patients, and, and they came back and they said, you know what, I prefer to smoke cannabis because when I take this by mouth, it takes a long time to have an effect, and the effect lasts a lot longer. And in fact, I get more zonked when I swallow this pill than when I inhale cannabis. And what the patients were telling us was really the different pharmacokinetics between inhaled and oral THC. When inhaled, the peak plasma concentration is reached in two and a half minutes, rapidly declines. When taken by mouth, it takes two and a half hours and there's a half-life, terminal half-life of 25 hours. Also, when taken by mouth, the main psychoactive component, delta-9 THC, gets metabolized in the liver to an, another psychoactive metabolite. So people do get more of a pronounced effect taking it by mouth than inhaling it. So this led uh, to my interest in saying, yes, is there a difference between inhalation and uh, ingestion? And so I tried uh, to get uh, government funding to do a, a study showing, first of all, that inhaled cannabis was useful in AIDS wasting, but I was a little bit naive, and I didn't realize that the only legal source of cannabis for studies in the United States is NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And NIDA has a congressional mandate to only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So my request to study cannabis as a potential therapeutic agent was never going to work. And ultimately, I met with Alan Leshner, uh, who was at the time the director of NIDA in 1996, told him I really you know, didn't know if I should continue to try to proceed to get cannabis for research. And he's the one that explained that, Donald, we are the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not for drug abuse. And so. 1996 was another hallmark year because that's when protease inhibitors, the drugs that were you know, very useful in turning around the AIDS epidemic and, and patients who were dying became available. But with that, there was another opportunity because protease inhibitors are metabolized in the liver by the same enzymes that metabolize other pharmaceuticals and recreational drugs. And there was a report of a person dying from combining protease inhibitors with ecstasy or MDMA. So suddenly a light bulb went off and I said, okay, I'm going to submit a clinical trial to NIDA to see if it's safe for patients on protease inhibitors to inhale cannabis. So we did submit that and in 1997 I got a million dollars and 1,400 of the government's finest cigarettes to do research in patients with HIV on protease inhibitors. And in fact we showed that it was safe we did not change the viral load. We did not change 
uh, clinically significantly the level of protease inhibitors in the bloodstream, and in fact, we may have boosted some of the immune function. We also demonstrated that both cannabis and dronabinol patients gained weight compared to the placebo group, and this was a 21-day inpatient clinical trial. At the end of the 1990s, the state of California actually had a budget surplus, and that allowed one of our state senators to appropriate funds, $3 million a year for three years, to establish a Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California. And the purpose of the center was to fund clinical trials that might show that cannabis has some clinical benefit. Still, the cannabis had to come from NIDA, but the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research sort of greased the wheels so it became easier to manipulate all the different hoops that we need to jump through to get uh, clinical trials approved and to receive the cannabis. So with funding uh, from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, I was able to conduct a study showing a placebo-controlled study showing that cannabis was more effective than placebo in relieving painful peripheral neuropathy or nerve damage in patients with HIV whose nerves were damaged either by the virus itself or the treatments that we used. And appreciating that smoking a cigarette was not an acceptable mode of delivery for a medicine, we then studied the volcano vaporizer as a smokeless delivery system. And this was the easiest study I've ever done in my life because we were looking for 25 to 40 year old cannabis smokers uh, and we put them in our clinical research center for six days, uh, gave them $600 and on each day they either smoked half of a cigarette or vaporized the other half of the cigarette of three different strengths of Nidus cannabis. Uh, we had to beat people away with a stick because everybody wanted to participate in that study. Ultimately, we showed that there was bioequivalence, that the THC levels in the blood were equivalent, that there was less expired carbon monoxide, which indicates exposure to noxious gases, and that the high, the perception of the patient's psychoactivity was equivalent. Actually, it was almost difficult to publish the paper because one of the reviewers' comments was, how did you verify the high? What was your gold standard? You know, how did, what did, anyway, so that's one of the difficulties of doing cannabis research. Uh, at the end of the day, I felt that one of the studies that I got uh, lost funding for, I, I, I will say I've had a difficult time enrolling cancer patients in my clinical trials. Uh, for reasons that are probably worth studying as well. But a study that I had funding for from the CMCR, but I lost, was to look at the potential synergy between cannabinoids and opioids in pain relief in cancer patients. I resubmitted that after the CMCR ran out of funds to NIDA, saying I wanted to see if it was safe for patients on sustained release opiates to add vaporized cannabis to their regimen. So we took a small number, 10 patients with sustained release morphine and chronic pain and 11 sustained release oxycodone, and we exposed them to vaporized cannabis three times a day, and we measured the pharmacokinetics of the opiates, and we also looked at whether there was any impact on their pain. We found, again, no clinically significant interaction between cannabis and the opiates, and we did see a suggestion of increase in pain relief, but the study was way too small to have pain as an endpoint. Uh, a few years later, I was approached by Kalpna Gupta, who's a mouse scientist at the University of Minnesota, who has a mouse model of sickle cell disease. And Kalpna said in her mice, the synthetic cannabinoids that she's able to acquire uh, seem to decrease pain, inflammation, and blood markers of disease progression. So she came and asked me if I would do a clinical trial, a proof of principle translational study in people with sickle cell disease. So having already done our cannabinoid opioid interaction, I thought this would be easy to do and we submitted a proposal. I told her I was interested in looking at high THC, low CBD, high CBD, low THC, balanced THC and CBD, and placebo. For those of you not familiar, CBD or cannabidiol is a non-psychoactive uh, cannabinoid that appears to be anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and seems to have activity in uh, seizure disorders as well. 
So she said, fine, you can only do two arms and one has to be placebo. So I said, okay, let's do balance THC and CBD. And as mentioned, the government uh, grow facility in Mississippi has been very responsive to my request. And Dr. El Suli produced a 5% THC, 5% CBD strain. Now I submitted, I submit all my studies to the Food and Drug Administration to get an investigator new drug approval. And usually they have been the most easy to work with and the most supportive of my work. However, they put a hold on this IND telling me that CBD was an NME, a novel molecular entity, and it had never been tested in humans before. And before I could proceed, they wanted me to give them two animal pulmonary histopathology studies showing what damage occurs in the lungs of mice and monkeys inhaling CBD. Well, that's not what I do, so I found two colleagues, one in Sydney and one in London, who were studying vaporized CBD for schizophrenia. They wrote me letters of support saying that it was non-toxic, and then I sent them screenshots from dispensary menus where patients in California are uh, uh, obtaining 10% and 15% CBD, and I sent them a picture of a rolled cigarette that was 9% CBD. So they said, okay, you can proceed with your study, but first send us two animal pulmonary histopathology or only enroll patients in your study who have already inhaled CBD so you're not putting them at any greater risk than they've already put themselves. Plus, add to the consent form that CBD can cause sterility in males. I don't know how they know that if it's an NME, but you know. So we did it and that's what we're doing. Wow. So that's sort of the scope of my research and from the work I've done, I do believe that cannabis is a medicine. I do want to say that I'm also an oncologist. I'm chief of hematology oncology at what we now call the Zuckerberg San Francisco General <laughs> Hospital. Every day I see patients in clinic, and I've been an oncologist for 35 years, I see patients in clinic with nausea, vomiting, pain, weight loss, depression, anxiety, insomnia. For these patients I can recommend that they try one medicine and instead of prescribing five or six different medicines that may interact with each other or the chemotherapy that I'm giving them, I say, try cannabis. Uh, I find, I, I ask all my patients, what brings you joy? And the number of cancer patients who say that gardening brings them joy is not insignificant. I think if you're dying or if you feel that part of you has died, the ability to bring life out of the ground is a blessing and to grow your own medicine is very empowering. So I do believe that cannabis is a medicine. I believe it's been a medicine for over 3,000 years. I think it hasn't been a medicine in the United States for the last 74 years. And I agree that education of physicians and other providers is really integral. Most physicians, when I give a lecture, and I say, how many of you learned in medical school that this cannabinoid one receptor the CB1 receptor is the single most densely populated G protein coupled seven transmembrane pro domain receptor in the human brain. Nobody raises their hand. I think that's really shameful, the extent that cannabis prohibition prevents us from studying a wide class of potential therapies that can help many people with many different diseases. With that, I'll stop and thank you for your Th attention. Thank you, Donald. That raised a lot of questions, but I'll, as everybody else, bite my tongue and wait for uh, Ryan to oh. give us a view. All right, so we could probably talk for four days about this for next meeting. Um, <laughs> but uh, So I'm an experimental psychologist by training, uh, and I've been doing cannabis research for uh, 16 years now. Uh, I got into this uh, doing laboratory studies to characterize cannabis withdrawal and developing novel treatments for cannabis use disorders. Um, again, that was 16 years ago when that was the focus of what we were looking at for cannabis for everybody except for Donald. Um, and you know, with the legislative changes that have been happening across the U.S. now, it's opened literally a Pandora's box of questions. I mean, as a scientist right now, um, I'm a kid in a candy store because there are 10 lifetimes worth of research studies to be done and 
I'm kind of in a fortunate position to have been doing this a while. I can kind of pick and choose, and, and the breadth of the research that I'm doing now is expanding quite a bit. Uh, uh, so in addition to continuing looking at uh, uh, treatment and therapies for people who are struggling with cannabis use and having difficulty quitting, which does happen, people do have problems with it, but now there's this whole other area of clinical therapeutics um, and questions about just this whole new market. Uh, and so what I've been doing lately is, uh, is continuing uh, controlled laboratory studies looking at uh, the dose effects of cannabis through different routes of administration. Uh, Donald brought up an, an important point and so did Carrie earlier. Uh, smoking cannabis is different from eating it. It's different from vaporizing it uh, to some degree. Uh, there's transdermal products out there. We have no idea the bioavailability or pharmacokinetics of those. Um, and cannabis isn't cannabis. You know, there's a whole, it's a complicated thing and, and it could be very different. And so we're trying to do controlled laboratory studies to tease apart uh, what the different constituents of the cannabis plant uh, do differently and how important those variable ratios of THC to CBD and versus other components are. Uh, the other thing that I'm trying to do outside of the laboratory is to take advantage of the fact that we now have uh, millions of Americans and other people worldwide using cannabis as a therapeutic. And I think that until relatively recently, we've really missed out on the opportunity to collect natural history data from these folks. Um, we have an ongoing experiment. We have ongoing clinical trials, just not randomized, okay? And so uh, in, in partnership with a couple colleagues, we've established uh, validated uh, uh, surveys with validated questionnaires about general health, about specific health conditions uh, that we've launched through patient registries to try to collect information about the experience these people have. Uh, looking at clinical outcomes, looking at the acceptability of cannabis as a medicine, looking at the impact of using cannabis on use of other medications. Uh, those are all really important things that we just don't have any good sense of, even though medical cannabis has been approved for 10 years in the U.S. And so uh, with that kind of background, then, uh, I wanted just to kind of talk about some of the things that I think are important that have not already been mentioned by the other folks at the table here. They've covered a lot of it. Um, one of the questions that uh, Zach posed to us is, should we think about cannabis differently than other drugs or other medicines? And I think that there's really no good scientific rationale to do that, but people do it anyway. And the reason that, they're, that, you, that people think about it differently is because most people have this very strong political or an emotional attachment to it. They're, you know, like Carrie said, you're on one side of the room or the other. There's very few people sitting in the middle. And, uh, and, and cannabis for, on both sides is put up on a pedestal as being something that's completely different. Uh, the, the part of that that I get uh, asked about the most because of the pharmacokinetic data that I'm collecting is drugged driving. So how do you determine if a teenager driving down the road is high on cannabis? It turns out there's no good biomarker that indicates intoxication or impairment. Well, we don't have that for anything except alcohol. But people are making a really big deal about not having that for cannabis. And when I talk to law enforcement and national highway traffic safety folks, they don't care. They're interested in if the, if the person's impaired. They don't care why they're impaired. It could be cannabis, it could be cocaine, it could be sleep deprivation. It could be that they're too old to drive. Uh, so I think that setting different standards and, and kind of making things up, which is happening at, a, at the state level a lot of ways, um, these legislations that, that, are, that, that are kind of being made up because people feel they have to have them, but that aren't based in science is a mistake. And, and, and it's creating us the opportunity to try to conduct important scientific studies to try to drive that, um, but we, we, have to, we have to not force the issue when it can't or shouldn't be forced. Um, uh, the other thing, too, is, is sitting through this conference today has been fascinating for me. I'm not a physician. This isn't the kind of stuff I usually think about or deal with. 
um, but it made me realize and reflect that cannabis really is relevant here, and Zach had a really good um, idea in bringing us to this, because through the legislative process, cannabis has been putting medicine in the hands of the patient, okay? So to go get medical cannabis, you're not going to a pharmacy. You're not getting it from your doctor, even though you need a doctor's recommendation to try it. Um, it's the patient going to a dispensary, selecting from the thousands of choices that they have in there, um, and, and making a decision on their own to kind of circumvent traditional therapies for whatever health condition they have. They may have tried other therapies and, and nothing works, so now they're looking at cannabis as a last resort. Some people look at it as a, as a first line of treatment for a number of health conditions now. A lot of that is driven um, by anecdote, by websites, by media coverage, uh, by interactions with friends, family, and, and, and other folks, but not a lot of it's driven by science. We only have good scientific research on a handful of health conditions, but when you look across the states at the legislature, there's probably 50 different health conditions that are listed as potentially viable health conditions that cannabis could treat. So from a patient perspective, you're now looking at cannabis as an alternative therapy. There's a lot of support behind it, public support. Uh, it's available and you can buy it in your state, in, in half the United States. But you don't really know what the relative uh, risk benefit is for it. You don't really know how likely it is that you will respond positively or negatively to it versus another alternative treatment for any health condition. Uh, there's, not a, there's nothing published in the scientific literature that can really give you a good advice on what dose you should start with, what the appropriate route of administration should be, um, or what type of cannabis you should get, whether it's the high CBD or the high THC or the one-to-one -one ratio or, or anything in between. Uh, and by doing so, it's almost uh, removing the patient from having this interaction and conversation with their physicians in some places. And talking to Carrie, she's saying that that stigma is kind of easing a little bit in Colorado, but Colorado is by far and away the most liberal and open about cannabis use uh, anywhere in, in, in the country. In Maryland, where I live, you know, we have a medical cannabis law, but it's not available yet, and very few physicians are chomping at the bit to jump in and get involved with this, and I have a feeling that a lot of patients would be very hesitant to go and have an honest conversation with their physicians about using cannabis. Um, so I think that, that, that that's something that, you know, this is patient-centered, but we need to think carefully about these types of relationships and, and how it's being conceived. And, and whether or not it's appropriate to have cannabis being set aside and, and separate from everything else in terms of healthcare. The other, the other issues that we have uh, surround just lack of knowledge and lack of standards. Okay, that's something that's been touched on a little bit, you know, but all other medicine, you know, we have standards for the manufacturing, the labeling, uh, the content, what, is, what a unit dose is. Um, you know, Colorado went out there and said, you know, 10 milligrams is a unit dose for an edible. You don't have a unit dose for smoking or vaping or creams. Um, and luckily for you guys, my laboratory research supports 10 milligrams. I talked to somebody over there, said they kind of just threw a dart at a board and came up with that. But, um, you know, the, the good thing is, is that you're thinking about that. Uh, but, you know, you, you, there's no validated methods. We don't know how to test the products, right? So the way you test the THC concentration of a plant isn't necessarily the same way you test the THC content of a brownie, right? And we don't have the science to inform what that is. Um, we don't know what's the right storage conditions for it. We don't know the stability. So if something sits on the shelf in a dispensary for two months, is it the same as when it came in? Um, and so all of these quality assurance issues are, I think, are really important for us to kind of think through and recognize and, and deal with. You know, at some point, either the states and patients and other folks need to come together and, and, and help get this stuff done, or the FDA needs to get over the fact that they didn't act on this 20 years ago and accept responsibility for that and move forward and, and take control of it now. 
Um, and in terms of, of research, you know, I think we've got a, 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 a huge um, patient access resource for natural history studies, but that doesn't take the place of good controlled clinical trials. Uh, what we have, um, you know, it, respective of, the, of these orphan drug type things. We have CBD oils and we have very highly uh, publicized cases of kids with Dravet syndrome having this astounding response to CBD oil. And you can't deny that. Uh, but is that representative of children with Dravet? Probably not. And so what we have is an unpublished clinical trial from a product that GW Pharmaceuticals developing. We have got a case series, but we don't know the rate or range of responding that kids with Dravet are going to have. And we don't know if the kids with Dravet are going to be, have a differential response than kids with other childhood seizure disorders that are different. And so I think that you still need the clinical trials to understand that. Um, but as Donald uh, you mentioned, you know, the regulatory process of doing these is also still very difficult. You know, he blazed the trail for us. I'm trying to follow right in his path and do some of this stuff. But CBD, a non-psychoactive substance, is still considered a Schedule One drug. And to get a Schedule One DEA license to do research is a big pain in the butt. It can be done. you got to be really patient. Um, but you know, there are barriers to getting this stuff done, which I think is, is research that needs to happen. And so we're trying to catch up with all of this stuff. Uh, and then I think the other thing to, the, that is important just to mention and put out there is trying to understand the difference of cannabis versus its constituents. And so the, the, um, the example that Larry mentioned, you know, you, you don't give the patient the plant, tell them to grow it and smoke the flowers. You isolate the specific compound that's having the therapeutic effect for that particular health indication. So with cannabis, we have at least anecdotal evidence that it's helpful for all kinds of stuff. But if it's that broad, and the endocannabinoid system is a very broad uh, system that has lots of effects on our physiology and our well-being, you, ideally, you want to be able to isolate and get targeted therapeutics, but you don't necessarily want to do that at the expense of if this plant together has some unique combination of these things. And so it's going to be interesting to move forward trying to get more targeted isolated therapeutics derived from specific compounds in the plant, it, but without but also understand whether or not there's something unique about combinations and how to isolate and, and identify those and bring them forward as therapeutics. So, you know, I think currently that's the future of cannabinoid medicine is more targeted specific therapeutics. But in the interim, you don't deny people compassionate use of something that we think works pretty well for a number of different things. And as they're using it, it's important and it's, and it's on us to collect information so that we can inform the future development. Thank you very much, Ryan. So I, I'll speak for myself and say that I learned a lot just listening to all four of you. And certainly what you talked about, they didn't teach us in medical school. And I imagine they probably don't teach that much of it in medical school today either. And um, a lot of what you said actually uh, resonated with some of the things that we heard about earlier today. But I have to admit, one of the th things that intrigued me, and I still admit uh, this is not a, uh, I'm not saying this rhetorically, I am genuinely confused. Um, how is it uh, that we have a, it, seemed, it might be a drug, and it's a it's Schedule One drug. Why is the F, where is the FDA on this? Why does it not require FDA approval? It's unique in that it was legislatively passed as medicine. It hasn't been approved as medicine. So it, it, cannabis has not gone through the, the traditional drug oh. development oh. process. Even though it may have therapeutic potential, it hasn't gone through clinical trials as we normally would do with any other novel therapeutic. I think part of that stems from the fact that it's already available. So when you develop a novel molecule, you can't buy it down the street. Cannabis, you can. And, uh, and so 
legislators have been put in a difficult situation where they have constituents coming to the state house and every state saying, look, I've tried the other anti-emetic medications. I've tried the other, you know, uh, neuroleptic medications. I've tried this, that, and the other, and nothing works except cannabis. And cannabis changed my life. It saved my life. And I've talked to patients that say that. Cannabis saved my life. And so, and it's available. And so d it's difficult for people to say, well, we're gonna d go do clinical trials for the next 15 mm -hmm. years, and we'll get back to you on that. Um, so they've kind of circumvented the whole process, and this is the first time that's happened. Well, I only mention that because I'm sure there are some rare disease patient communities would love to fall suit. You know, they couldn't care whether or not the FDA, and if they could only get a state to say, give this drug, they'd grab that opportunity. I'm not saying it's, it's going to happen at any time. I think but what's unique here with that is that cannabis has existed and has been used for a long time and is, has a relatively known safety profile as a result. And so the states have that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I think that, that hasn't been brought up uh, that I think is interesting is that the FDA does have that compassionate use license that they can give to individuals to use a drug that's in development. And I don't know how often that gets used in, in these orphan um, drug designations, but I know, for example, the, the, the CBD product that's being developed for the childhood seizure disorder is the FDA has issued 400 of those licenses to uh, families who, to, to use that while it's still in development. And just to be clear, um, the isolated molecules, the NMEs, are FDA reviewed. Is that right or is that not true? Well, one of them, THC, is already approved. So that's Schedule that's three. Schedule three. It's on the market. You can get it right now. And what was the FDA approval process for that? That dronabinol. That was, that was the one that I mentioned was approved in 1986 mm -hmm. for nausea and vomiting related to chemo. It was standard clinical trial. And it can be used off-label. Perhaps. Yes. Yeah, it's very yes. expensive, though, so it's I see. not usually covered. Okay, great. Well, I have a lot more questions, but uh, um, I want to welcome the audience. So, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, but first of all, you have got to introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm Andy McMurray, um, formerly a student of Zach, and um, I'm here to make a statement from a friend of mine, Sarah Dodge, who has a seven-year-old with epilepsy. Uh, her statement is, I moved to Eugene, Oregon to keep James, age seven, my son, in a medical marijuana research program. It is the only thing that has ever shown real promise. Typically, he has 80 plus seizures per cluster. Grand mal has since birth. Uh, where do they, you the panel, stand on the whole plant-based uh, therapy versus the increasingly popular CBD-only therapy? CBD-only was a failure. Move to Oregon, use the whole plant. Seizures stopped. Well, I'll start. Uh, Larry, I, I saw Larry was beginning to I'm slowly move. The mic. I'm going to shut no, up Come, come on, Larry, go with the impulse. Yeah, so uh, all I'll say is, you know, again, at the population health level, uh, you know, we hear a lot of these anecdotes, but what you don't hear are the kids who don't respond, uh, the parent who's concerned because, again, because of quality control, um, there's THC that's tainting the product and they don't like the way that that's making um, their child react. You don't hear about the kids who are suffering some of the potential side effects and some of the effects of, of contamination. So um, I, I understand and, and we do appreciate, you know, the, the whole plant versus um, the oil sort of debate. But, you know, from my perspective, looking at the population, y you have to take into account some of these other considerations. Please identify yeah, the, yourself. The, the other issue no. related to that is that the CBD oil they bought may not have had CBD in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the FDA has issued letters to probably 20 some companies now that have sold CBD oil over the internet or in, in uh, retail stores. They were purchased and tested and had negligible or no CBD in them. Mm -hmm. so, so you can't trust the, the marketplace, unfortunately, because there's not a regulatory oversight body policing this. So the thing I should tell her is that the reason it's working is because it's a better distributor? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it, at, at this point, we haven't necessarily, it, it could be, 
um, that when you extract CBD from the plant that you're extracting something else and that's what's having the therapeutic benefit. We don't know. Um, the, it may not be the case. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Steve. And, um, so I used to live in Boulder. So one of the hubs of this uh, moved out here recently. Uh, two questions, one, and really on the consumer side. One is, uh, what sort of research has been done on the long-term impact of the use of marijuana? And then the other one, which actually is of great concern, and, and Larry, and you're, you're talking about it having lived out in the foothills, uh, the issue of heavy metals, for example, and where the stuff is grown. And so what I'm really interested in, uh, in relation to that, is what is being done practically to, in a sense, define quality around marijuana and to begin to allow us to understand what it is we're buying or is it a completely impossible task? Um, and so th those two different questions, one is the longer term impact because I know lots of kids in Boulder, my daughter grew up in Boulder where there's been a lot of uh, marijuana around and been concerned on the part of the parents. And then the other issue is that quality control problem and how do you define marijuana and what I'm buying? So I'll take the second half and I'll, I'll let the researchers uh, comment on the long-term effects. So again, what we had to do was create um, standards, laboratory standards, um, so that um, private laboratories could come in, perform the potency testing as well as contaminant testing. Um, we then had to set up the certification process through our state lab. And then, oh, by the way, we had to um, find a reference lab uh, which is also very challenging because if a reference lab, like many do, receive federal funding, you could in fact jeopardize that federal funding as a result of now having them be a reference lab for something that's considered Schedule One and illegal. So as far ahead of the curve as we are, this is only something only recently within the last year we've been able to, to start to do. And, and, and we did start with potency because that was easier and now we've gone to uh, the, the types of contaminants that I've talked about and looking at what those profiles look like and, and because you know you can't test the whole world uh, of contaminants or potential contaminants you have to try and sort of uh, come up with a profile uh, which we've since developed and have since developed a reference library um, so that that can now be evaluated by the rest of the experts uh, to say yeah I think you're on the right track or, or you're not. So every product that's sold through the retail, um, uh, through the stores, um, has to be labeled uh, and is, is then certified. Uh, we haven't talked about the caregiver market, which is the home grow. Uh, you know, this is like uh, growing your own tomatoes instead of buying them from the store. How are you going to assure both potency as well as safety when you have 5,000 caregivers who are home growing? Uh, or growing for themselves, for their children, you know, for, um, for other patients. And that's a, a whole nother sort of can of worms. Yeah, and uh, to, to follow up on that, another tricky thing is, is, um, is again, standards. So we had, there are known pesticides, known uh, things that are carcinogenic. But what's an acceptable level? And, and so there are a number of, of relevant agencies, the Association for Public Health Laboratories have been having a lot of conversations about this and they're trying to establish recommended standards for, um, for companies to follow. Um, but again, there's no federal standard at this point, which is I think what's needed. Uh, with regards to long-term effects, um, you know, most of the data we have there is not for medical use. So uh, when you talk about long-term health consequences, uh, th there's an impact of, it depends a little bit on what product you're using and how often you're using it, just like any other drug. If you're using something 10 times a day, every day, the health impact is gonna be different than if it's once a week. Um, there are, uh, there, the high THC cannabis has an impact on memory, some cognitive functioning. Uh, there's associations between cannabis use and, and mental health disorders, but that can't be established as causal, they're just correlations. Uh, dependence can occur uh, with, if that happens within a medical use scenario is, is probably much less likely than if it's non-medical use. 
Uh, and then in terms of long-term therapeutics, you know, the longest clinical trial, I think, is somewhere on the order of two weeks of studying the clinical benefits of one of these drugs. So we don't know if there's going to be tolerance to the clinically beneficial effects in the long run. Uh, and depending on the indication, if you try to stop, if your symptoms will get exacerbated or whatnot, I have a little bit of concern about that in some of the uh, disorders for high THC stuff or for things like PTSD. You know, acute symptom mitigation makes sense, but you might also see exacerbation with withdrawal. Donald Tashkin is an investigator at the University of California, Los Angeles, who's been studying for 40 years the health consequences, pulmonary effects of cannabis use, and basically a little increased risk of chronic bronchitis is what he found. In people who smoke tobacco and cannabis, they have less of a risk of COPD than people who smoke tobacco alone. His piece de resistance study looked at 1,365 upper aerodigestive malignancies in Los Angeles. And in a case control study, they actually found that people who were using cannabis had fewer lung cancers than people who didn't. And that seems to be also uh, borne out by some preclinical study and some work from a Kaiser database as well. Uh, pulmonary functions don't seem to be impaired. Uh, the uh, Igor Grant, who is the director of the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research as a psychiatrist, did a long-term follow-up on cognitive and memory issues and pretty much what was already mentioned. Uh, cancer, other cancers have been suggested to be increased in cannabis users, including prostate and uh, testicular. Uh, the biological mechanism for that is, is somewhat unclear. David. Uh, I just, I want to express how I love how this day is all coming together because what we just heard, this case, this single case that sounds exactly like Karen's story in the morning, you know, somebody who responds to nothing and all of a sudden this is happening and we don't know why, it could be their unique personalized biology of some sort and here you are, all of you, in the position, it, it brings me back to the very earliest days of learning science, even in grade school, how we decide what we know and what is dependable knowledge, because you are in charge of figuring out and regulating and guiding in a world where we don't yet know what even needs to be controlled. Now, I mean, what's that like? Does this drive you nuts, or is it, to me, it's kind of a wild ride, but I'm watching it. I'm not in the middle of it. So I, I want to thank you all for, because you've got to use all your scientific training for public good in it when we don't even know what certainty is. You know? And as you think about the answer, I just want to give a forward pointer to our next uh, uh, panel. So for example, you'll hear uh, from George Church, I think, about uh, gene editing. Um, and I've seen some active discussions whether gene-edited foods, for example, will, form, will fall under GMO uh, legislation. And so I think there are these amazing corner cases that start ending up being very big examples of a different way of thinking about things. So, but let's hear about what your response is about. Is this a wild ride? And if so, it's a pleasant or unpleasant wild ride? <laughs> It's a, it's a very pleasant wild ride, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're, I'm in Colorado. We have fracking too, but we're not going to talk about that today. So, but the, the people who want to tell you, uh, uh, to use that as an example, uh, that fracking is bad for your health, um, rely on the same sort of data set that the people uh, who are pro medical marijuana. Uh, like to use that same sort of basis for um, establishing, you know, the medicinal value of marijuana. So we have a nice detente in Colorado as a result. Um, you know, all, all that being said, you know, legalization has changed things for us uh, with regard to availability. You know, patients now have the choice and the ability, uh, or consumers, um, to access these products without necessarily having to call it medicine or without necessarily having to have um, the physician involved. And that's something that for me is more comfortable 
because um, we don't have to then necessarily sort of rely on uh, randomized uh, clinical controlled trials that don't necessarily exist, and we don't have to necessarily rely on the physician community that's very uncomfortable being uh, put uh, in this position. Um, so there's accessibility and availability without necessarily um, having to have it as part of a medical program. But I think that what we've seen in Colorado has definitely changed with, with the legalization of recreational use because previously, because of the stigma, people would not disclose that they were using the product. You would not know till, till maybe there was a, a, a reason to disclose it, you know, a specific inquiry because of some effect. And, and now what we see, I think, that's, that's quite different is that patients will perhaps go purchase and come and talk to you and say, I bought this. What do you think? Because I'm going to try it. So they're, they're looking for the, the affirmation that this is a good idea through legitimate um, uh, kind of medical channels. Or um, if it's the first time you're seeing a patient, they will, they will happily disclose, yes, I'm here to see you for this condition. However, you need to know I have been using this for blank to blank period of time, and this is what I think is happening. So in, in reality, I think that, that it's, we're in a better place than we were a few uh, a few years ago when, when it was still um, only being asked under the, of the, uh, the medical history under the drugs of abuse category instead of, oh, you have pain. Have you tried uh, medical marijuana for this? Have you sought other, other therapies? Um, patients are now much more likely to, to be inquiring and really asking um, traditional uh, medicine what um, what their thoughts are on it. I want to forgive, uh, beg forgiveness to the panel because I'm going to cut off discussion of that last question so we can have this young lady who will identify herself ask the last question. Hi, um, my name is Jacinta Lumba. I'm a rising senior at Brown University and I'm here for the summer at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and so what I think is really interesting about the marijuana controversy in medicine is the interaction that happens between science and culture. Um, and so I was wondering if, you know, we are ever to realize and really establish the medicinal um, benefits of cannabis, um, will it first take sort of like a, a shift in cultural and so social and political attitudes towards the drug, or will it first require, um, you know, some sort of concrete scientific uh, realization to then change um, the culture we have around, or the social ideas that we have around cannabis? I think it's happening simultaneously. I mean, the, just the fact that, that, that the states are, are out there and have legalized this, the scientific community is scrambling to provide information and to try to understand what's happening and what's going on with the people. And the more states that pass it, the more science that comes out that lends some credence to the fact that it does have therapeutic benefit the more acceptable it's going to be in turn and, and a reduction of stigma is going to be observed and that, that's what we're seeing and colorado is the best example of that so i think that's a wonderful answer to a wonderful final question i want to thank our panel again for a really illuminating talk.